Someone once said, the truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. The themes of suffering and death Jesus talks so much about in the Gospels drive this sentiment home, and no more starkly than in today's passage from Mark. When Jesus predicts his suffering and death that will befall him, as he does three times in Mark, he includes the part about being raised up again, but his disciples can only hear the part about dying, and Peter rebukes him. Like any loyal friend, Peter can't bear the idea of Jesus being killed, and he's not afraid to say so. Just a few verses before these, Peter answers correctly when Jesus asks his disciples who they think he is. You are the Messiah, Peter says. But clearly and understandably, Peter's idea of Israel's long-awaited Messiah does not include great suffering, rejection, and death at the hands of their own elders, chief priests, and scribes. Humanly speaking, Peter's defense of Jesus is the genuine concern of a loyal friend. So it's a shock to see how dramatically Jesus turns on him. Get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind on not on divine things, but on human things. How is it that Peter's gut reaction to Jesus' imminent suffering and death is a serious enough gaffe for Jesus to call him Satan and color him miserable? Why the sudden rain on Peter's parade? What was wrong with wanting their mission to flourish in Jerusalem? What was wrong with wanting to avoid suffering and death? What was wrong is that it denied an accurate picture of the world as it is, a world where suffering and death are unavoidable realities. Throughout the wisdom tradi traditions, including Jesus' wisdom teachings, a central teaching is that in order to live free, you have to accept suffering and death as inevitable and face them head on. What was wrong with Peter's impulse is that it denied the possibility that God could endure and overcome suffering and death. Peter's reaction betrayed what Jesus knew on his way to the cross and what we know on the other side of Easter, and that is not even Jesus in his humanity would escape death. He died a real Good Friday death, violent and painful. But God was still there. God was still creating, and there was resurrection on the third day. The human violence that took Jesus' life was shown for what it is, empty and meaningless, and no match for the power of God. Death and resurrection would be the mainsprings that launched the newly forming church, and still, for the Christian church today, everything hinges on our understanding the central mystery that is Christ's death and resurrection. But more than being understood, death and resurrection really need to be experienced. They really need to be lived. Death and resurrection say that it is possible to see a way through every act of violence, every moment of suffering, rejection and failure, every act of bullying or hate, every experience of death, including but not only the loss of life, but death of our years as we age, the death of certain hopes and dreams, the death of relationships. It is possible to see in all of these things an occasion for God to bring us through them to the other side and to resurrect us to new life. Suffering and death real and final though they seem in the moment, are not the end. They are the passageway to a new beginning, the means for a new thing to happen, if we are able to let them go, put these deaths behind us with God's help, and open ourselves to the possibility of a new thing. Jesus, the consummate wisdom teacher, says this to his disciples, those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. The modern day wisdom teacher, Cynthia Bourgeau, says this need to lose one's life before you can live is the eye of the needle in every major religion. And when we talk about this kind of dying, we really mean dying to our fear of death, the small deaths we suffer daily and literal death alike. 
How do we overcome our fear of death? What was Jesus asking of his disciples? And what is he asking of us? Jesus told his disciples that if any want to be his followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Jesus. Get behind him. Don't stand in his way or in the way of a deeper life by trying to stave off suffering. This image of taking up the cross has been misconstrued through the ages. Even beginning with Constantine, who wielded a cross into battle and declared Christianity to be the official religion of his empire, he went on to kill all who would not submit to this new religion. Medieval crusaders lifted high a cross as they swept across continents to wipe out Muslims in the name of Christ. And in our own modern age, plenty of wars and violence have been waged in Jesus' name, and often with a cross emblazoned on signs and t-shirts, like a logo for religious violence. Needless to say, to take up the cross in these ways is to betray the true meaning of the cross, which is love and forgiveness all the way. In baptism, we make the sign of the cross on the forehead of the newly baptized, declaring they are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. The cross is applied with oil like a brand on our foreheads. Its symbolism is indelible and permanent. In every sacramental moment, we speak very comfortably and beautifully about death and the cross and resurrection because the entire baptized Christian life of faith is oriented around this pattern of dying and being raised, dying and being raised, with the hope and reassurance of Easter always in view. Beginning with baptism, we say we are buried with Christ in his death so we can share in his resurrection. At funerals, we say, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And in death, life is changed, not ended. The Apostle Paul wrote to the early church in, the, in Colossians, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And at Easter, we proclaim with the prophet Isaiah that death has been swallowed up in victory. Unless we train ourselves in ways of recognizing death and resurrection as it plays out in our lives, this pattern of death and resurrection remains an abstraction, mere words of encouragement that we struggle to truly understand in the marrow of our bones until we have no choice. This is Lent, and as the last couple of sermons you've heard here from this pulpit said, we don't have to look far for suffering this year. This church season merely lends us a particular framework through which to view the year-long Lent we're experiencing. We have had and continue to have every opportunity to explore what it means to die, literally and figuratively, collectively and individually, by living through an historic pandemic. It has revealed our fault lines collectively and individually. It has brought, us, brought out our heroism as well as our impatience our weakness as well as our resilience, our courage as well as our fear, our love for our neighbors as well as our bitterness towards some. Denying ourselves and taking up the cross to follow Jesus in these trying and uncertain days means to pause long enough in the midst of the pain and ask, what are we afraid of? And what can we let go of? To sit with the answers we come up with and to make peace with them is to give them to God, to let go of each fear, that is to accept death large and small until we can release their hold on us and be freed from them. Lent is a time for repentance, and we think that word means to be sorry, but it's much more complex than that. To repent means to choose again differently, to change one's mind, and to find a new path. We can't always put an end to our sufferings, but we can choose how to face them. Our cross is anything that can lead us towards living courageously for the sake of deeper love, greater kindness, braver courage, larger justice, more lasting peace than we have ever known. 
When people are afraid of death, they are at their worst. They despair, lie, manipulate, deceive, twist the truth, scapegoat, hoard, commit violence, and even kill others to protect themselves or their own. But everything of eternal worth arises on the other side of this fear of death. Joy, courage, gentleness, peace, compassion, freedom, forbearance, clarity. The poet Rilke said, the free man lives with his death behind him and his life up ahead. It was hard for Peter to accept suffering and death as a means of transformation and life up ahead in his world. And it is no more or less difficult for us to accept them in our death-defying and death-delaying world. We all want the good news without the miserable news, the raised up part by avoiding the suffering part. In short, we want resurrection without dying. But if we want to share in the power of Jesus' resurrected life, he says we must first share in his death. And this can happen every time we choose God's way over our way, every time we do the difficult thing that involves giving up ourselves or a part of ourselves to help another person or to promote healing and reconciliation and justice. When we look inside and do the spiritual work of facing our fears, we experience a death to ourselves and to our egos, and we are taking up our cross and following Jesus. No matter what happens to us in this life, whatever suffering and death we are facing, whatever regrets or mistakes we have made, these are not the end of life for us. Even in the midst of them, God is doing a new thing in us, deepening our self-awareness, bolstering our resilience, clarifying the things that matter most, and challenging us to drop the illusion that we are self-sufficient masters of our own fate. And when we let these fearful selves in us die, we are most assuredly raised up into new lives of courage and renewal and love. If this truth about suffering and death at first makes you miserable, welcome to the club. But listen to the call to not be afraid and expect to be raised up. This is the truth that sets us free.